now considered by the company because they were acquired in 2004. Uh, would it be right to value it as a private company or do we look at the public company because it's still the same thing? I also found something interesting on their board is that it's comprised of members of the acquiring company, so both of the acquirers put uh, two board members in. Their CEO is the chairman, who's an executive, and they have just one board member from outside who's from uh, American Express. Everything else is the same people as close to you. My guess is this board is probably going to be much more active than it is before because the owners have very much to say. Okay. Okay, folks. A reminder again that we that we don't have class on Wednesday. Right? That's the first reminder. The second is your second quiz is a week from Wednesday, so it's not the day you come back. Now I wanted to give you a little bit of leeway after Thanksgiving, but it's a week from Wednesday. It'll cover all of Packet Two, which is pricing and what we will cover: private company valuation, asset-based valuation. So, you no. Know, Keep that in mind as you, oh, your third quiz, right? Third quiz, yeah, third quiz will be a week from Wednesday. Okay, so your mystery projects I can see coming in as I check the box this morning. I mean, please don't, don't forget to put the subject line, right? No mystery here. I, there were about eight or 10 projects that have come in already. I won't start grading them till five o'clock simply because I don't want the feedback going out just as projects are still being done. So it's not fair then to the people who've already turned in the projects if other people get to see the feedback and fix their projects before they send them back. So starting at about 5 o'clock, I'm going to line them up and go bang, 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 bang. So I'll probably start grading before 5, but I'll line them up. So at 5.01, if you get your project, it's not like I read your project in one minute. It's because I had it ready to go at 5.01, you should start to see it. So maybe I'll wait till 6, because 5 is the deadline, but you know it's a quasi-deadline, so there'll always be people kind of stringing in till 6 o'clock. So I'll grade it on the, I'll start, I'll start lining it up on my train ride back. So by the time you get 6 o'clock, if you, and it'll go back chronologically, depending on when you send it. Also remember to carbon copy everybody else in your group when you send me the project, because when I reply to you, I will then reply all, which is not my default. So usually I uh, make sure, I, that way you will all get the graded project at the same time, because you're probably not going to see each other till next Monday. And I don't want people emailing me on Thanksgiving Day saying, I'm really, really stressed out. What did I get on the project? I will tell you, but I'll be really pissed off while I'm telling you. I won't act like I'm <laughs> pissed off. But, uh, you know, but uh, so just carbon copy me. I'll, I'll get the grades back to you. We ha don't have that many classes left. This is the 20th session, right? You have six more sessions left. So time is ticking. And the reason everything starts to stack up is we're running out of time. So today we're actually going to start talking about private company valuation. This actually is the bulk of all valuations done around the world are of private businesses, right? For lots of different reasons. 90% of all valuations are private business valuations. Some of you are valuing private companies. So today we're going to start talking about the challenges in valuing private companies. And the one thing I'm going to lay on the table before I even get started is don't change all the rules. Everything we've said about intrinsic value still applies. The value of a company is based on its cash flows, growth, and risk. That doesn't change just because you're a private company. So let's start off by kind of exploring some of the issues we're going to examine today. And we'll get, it's like a preview of, the, of what we're going to face today. 
Up till now, whenever I've had to estimate a cost of equity and a cost of capital for a company, I've used the market beta, right? Whether we use the bottom-up beta or regression beta, market beta. And a market beta measures only that portion of the risk that cannot be diversified away. So let's assume you're looking at two companies. One is a public company which, for which we've used this market beta concept to come up with the cost of equity. The other is an exactly identical private business. Same size, same business. Which one's going to have the higher cost of equity? The public or the private company? And why is the private company's cost of equity going to be? It's in the same business, so what is it that's going to make it risky? You want to try? And so let's put an if on it, because it could be that the marginal investors are Paul Allen. You know who Paul Allen is? He co-founded Microsoft with Bill Gates. Then, of course, he stepped away from Microsoft with a lot of money, and he started investing in private businesses. I think he owns the Portland Trailblazers still. But if I'm valuing the Portland Trailblazers and Paul Allen is the owner, then I can treat it very much like a public company. Do you see why? Because even though it's privately owned, he owns it in a portfolio of 30 or 40 other businesses that he holds on to. So not all private businesses face it, but if the private business owner is not diversified, the cost of equity is going to be higher, not because there's more risk in the company, but because the owner bears more risk since he can't diversify away the risk. So one of the challenges we're going to face today is what do we do about these companies? We can't just plug in betas and come up with the cost of equity. We have to augment that cost of equity for that additional risk that now might not be diversified away. So there are practical ways of doing it, and we'll approach it. But already you can see, if you're valuing a private business, don't be surprised to see 22, 21, 20% 20 cost of equity, whereas with public companies, you're far more likely to see 8, 9, or 10% cost of equity. Another issue with private businesses that we really don't even deal with with public companies is liquidity. As investors, we all care about liquidity, right? The way I think about liquidity is the cost of buyer's remorse. Have you ever had buyer's remorse? I always do. Whenever I've invested in a stock, two minutes later, what the hell have I done? In fact, I'm going to post today on my revisiting value, the stock that has not exactly delivered big money for me. I bought it at 27, it's at 18. So I revalued it and I decided, and I don't usually do this, to double down or double up, whichever, hopefully double up, not double down, because that will make me worse off. But as I hit the buy the thousand shares on um, last Wednesday, I finished hitting the, the buy button, you know, the order goes off into the ether space. My first reaction is, shit, what did I do now? Now, if you're, a public, if you're investing in a public company, what's the cost of buyer's remorse? If you want to reverse what you've just done, what do you do? Even if the trade's gone through, you sell the 1,000 shares. What have you lost from doing it? I mean, generally, the price hasn't changed. You're going to pay the $8.95 or whatever your trading cost was in both directions. But what else are you going to lose? Because that's almost nothing, right, on a big, uh, if you bought 1,000 shares. There's a much bigger cost, which is... Even if the market price hasn't changed, are you going to get your money back? There's a spread. You see how big can that be? For a valiant, it's not huge because it's a liquid enough company. But let's say you tried this on a NASDAQ stock. You see what's going to happen? You buy it too, you change your mind and sell back. You're going to get back $1.85 because there's a 15 cent spread. That is the cost of buyer's remorse with a public company. I'm already laying the foundations for what I think is a huge misconception which is private company appraisers think they and only they have to worry about illiquidity, and in public companies, there is no illiquidity. That's not true because it's a continuum, right? There's no investment in the world that's completely liquid. Even the most liquid stock, you can talk about how small the spread is, but it's never zero. So if you think about all investments, there is a liquidity discount in every investment. With public companies, you know why we don't care? You value a company. You find it undervalued. You go to try to buy it. If there's a huge spread, you know what you might find? That even though the market price looks like it's lower than your value, when you try to buy the stock because the spread is so wide that the price at which you'd have to buy is much greater than your value, you step back. So in public company valuation, liquidity takes care of itself when you try to buy it in the end. 
With a private company, there is no explicit illiquidity. So what you often have to do, and this is something we're going to confront, is after you value the private business, you've got to ask, how much of that value am I going to knock off because of illiquidity? Now, the rule of thumb that many private company appraisers use is the real rule of thumb. They'll knock off 25% for every company they value. I think which is an absolutely abysmal practice, if you think about it, because it applies the same discount to every business you value. So I'm going to ask you for some intuitive guidance on what that illiquidity discount should be. I'm going to list four different businesses, and I'd like you to tell me in which of these businesses the discount you're going to apply for illiquidity is greatest. First is a profitable cash flow generating company to a long-term buyer. So think about it for a moment. You're a long-term buyer. You have a profitable cash flow generating company. The second is a pro pro profitable cash flow generating co co company to a cash constrained buyer. What does that mean? Well, they have the money right now to buy the company, but they could run into a constraint. They're levered. They're borrowing to do this. The third is an unprofitable negative cash flow company to a long-term buyer. And the fourth is a negative, uh, unprofitable negative cash flow company to a cash constrained buyer. Let's focus on the buyers first. To who, who's going to apply the bigger discount? A long-term buyer or a cash-constrained buyer? The cash-constrained buyer. So obviously, already you can see that the discount you have to apply to a company should vary depending on whether you're selling it to somebody who's a long-term buyer or whether you're selling to somebody who's cash-constrained. Now let's focus on the second dimension. Profitable and unprofitable. Where do you think the discount's going to be greater? unprofitable and negative cash flow. Do you see why? Because if you have a profitable company generating cash flows, it creates its own liquidity, right? You don't have to sell the business. You're going to get cash flows every year that cover it. So you can already see that the discount should vary across businesses. It should vary across buyers and should vary across time. Why? Imagine trying to sell a business in November of 2008. So a private business. The liquidity discount would have been immense. The price that people attach to liquidity varies across time. And one definition of a market crisis is the price of liquidity just went up. So we're going to come back and talk about that because I think there is opportunity there for somebody who is a long-term buyer who doesn't care about liquidity because those are the moments where you can step in and get those incredible bargains because everybody else, they're not being irrational. They need liquidity so much they have to knock off huge percentages. So the 2008 versus 2013, you can already see that the timing matters. So liquidity discount should vary across time, across companies, and across buyers. Now let's take a final question. You're in a private business. It's a very successful private business. But you're getting to be 79. You're Children don't want to take over this business, and you think it's time to sell. You're looking at potential buyers. I won't get into the specifics of the potential buyers. I just want you to give me a sense of which of these potential buyers is likely to be your, offer you the highest price for your company. The first is another private owner. The second is a private equity fund. The third is a publicly traded company. The fourth is you need more information. Holding all else constant, which of these is going to pay you the highest price and why? In fact, if you think about the answer, the first question, the answer is there. Which one? And why? Yeah, that's, that's you know, but even if it's their personal wealth, there's an, even if they're prudent public company managers, you'll still, I think, will go with C. Why? You go with A. OK, what, what, so, so what, what are you going to get from A that? Every, let me say, set this on the table. Everybody wants to rip you off. And it's your job to make sure you don't get ripped off. Right? So I think that's a, very, that's a fairly cynical view, that private equity guys are all thieves and, and liars, and the private owner sitting across the table is this noble, altruistic, idealistic guy. It could happen, but I think that that might be a little too cynical even for me. Yeah. Tell me why. 
It's exactly what, it's an extension of the same. Remember the first question we said? When you're a private owner looking at a company and you're not diversified, it's very simple. A public company looking at your business will see less risk than a private company looking at exactly the same business. It is depressing for those people who think about mom and pop operations as the heart of an economy. Because what have I just said? Over time, what's going to happen to almost every business? It's going to get eaten up by public companies, not because private business owners don't work hard. They actually work harder than the public company managers, but because it's a very inefficient way to invest, to take all your wealth and put it into one business. You say, what about startups? As an entrepreneur with a tech startup, what's your definition of success? That you build this business and run it for the rest of eternity as a private business? I don't think so. Your definition of success is you want to get this business to a point where there's a public company or a public market waiting for you in an IPO, and you flip it and you walk away worth $12 billion. Evan Spiegel has been building up to this day that's going to come in a few weeks. All these, it doesn't mean that his heart's not with the company anymore. But if he ran it as a private business, it's definitely not worth 25 billion because he's got too much locked up in the business and he's going to always see more risk than a public investor looking. So there are all these fascinating issues that come up as you go public to private. So we're going to talk about those. But I want to first stop off and finish that last few pieces of some of the parts valuation. Remember last session I started on United Technologies? I broke them down into their six businesses. And I just done the pricing of the six businesses. Pricing in what sense? I applied a median EV to EBITDA multiple, came up with the price of each business, added them all up. And most analysts, when they talk about some of the parts valuation, that's exactly what they've done. I gave you a slightly more refined version of the pricing where rather than use one multiple EV to EBITDA and apply a median, I tried to come up with a different multiple for each business, adjusted for differences in growth and risk. And I came up with a pricing for the company, if you look at, where is it, of 74.2 billion. So these are both pricing. So the 66 billion I got with the median EV to EBITDA and the 74 billion are both pricings. But let's say I wanted to do a discounted cash flow valuation of the pieces. To get a discounted cash flow valuation, I need all of the inputs I need for a DCF. I need a cost of capital. I need a cash flow. I need a growth rate. And in this case, because of the level of detail that United Technologies gave on their individual businesses, I was able to do that. So I took each of their six businesses, looked up publicly traded companies in each space. So basically, I'm using exactly the same technique we use for an overall company. But now it's cleaner, because each business is a standalone business. And my costs of capital vary from 9.94% for Otis to 6.78% for UTC Fire and Security. Very different costs of capital for the six businesses because they have very different risk levels. So you notice that my beta is very across the businesses because they come from different sectors. My debt to equity ratio, I left it the same because I considered doing what we did in corporate finance of trying to allocate the debt, but these are all pretty capital intensive businesses. I decided it wasn't worth the effort. I gave them all the cost of debt that United Technology has because they all borrowed through the company. And there's my cost of capital in the last column. So half the game is done. I have a discount rate for each business. To get the cash flows, I had to do some, say, make some assumptions. They, United Technologies gave me numbers on total assets and capital invested by business. I allocated the capex for the company because they hadn't given me capex by business and reinvestment by business. So in other words, I tried to come up with capex depreciation working capital for each business. Again, because there was enough information in United Technology to do this, I was able to come up with a return on capital and reinvestment rate for each of the six businesses. And again, look at how different the businesses are. Remember United, the UTC Fire and Security had the lowest cost of capital? The return on capital is even worse. At the other extreme, you have businesses that make 35.7 and 24.5% returns on capital, reflecting much more high return businesses. So now I have a return on capital and reinvestment rate. Multiplying those two numbers will now give me a growth rate for each business. Different cost of capital for each of the six businesses, different growth rates. 
and then I had to make some judgments. Do I want to, and in fact, because each business is being valued with a separate DCF, some of the businesses, I assume, stable growth. In, in this case, UTC fire and security, almost no growth, return on capital close to the ca cost of capital. So basically, I just valued them as a mature business. With each one, I could therefore make a different judgment on whether I wanted to use a long growth, uh, you know, a high growth period, what growth rate to use, and those are the assumptions I made about return on capital in stable growth. So it's really six DCFs stacked on top of each other. When I plugged in the DCFs, I got a value for the operating assets, and the sum of the values across the DCFs is 80.25. So as I valued each business, I didn't subtract our debt and add cash because I didn't want to deal with that till I was done with the valuation of the operating assets. So all I did in the DCF is free cash flow to the firm, cost of capital, value 80.25. I'm almost home, but there's one final loose cent to tie up. I know you don't remember, but there was a $408 million corporate expense. Remember, I'm using all the EBITDA across these businesses. That 408 million is an expense that I haven't dealt with yet. I can take the cynical view that corporate is always useless, that I can just get rid of headquarters and nothing happens. But the reality is, that's where all my accountants might be. That might make it good. So, but let's think, that's where people are actually doing stuff, inventory. I mean, the, there is a reason why we, we centralize. $408 million in expenses. What, what do you think I should do with that? That's an annual expense, right? It's not going to go away. So here's what I did. I took the $408 million expense, assumed it would grow at the stable growth rate, because in a sense, it's growing, you know, the business is not that, uh, that high growth of business, and took the present value using the cost of capital for the entire, this is the only place where the cost of capital for the entire company comes about, because this is serving all the different businesses. What I got as a present value was $4.587 billion. That is the present value of corporate headquarters. It's a negative because it's all cost. You subtract that from the 80.25, you get a value, the sum of the parts DCF, of 75.7 billion. So to give you a contrast, when I just used the EV to EBITDA based upon multiples, I got 66 billion. When I used the refined pricing, where I, I got 74.23 billion. When I valued United Technologies as just a company, without breaking it down, I got 71 billion. The stock price at that I, the market cap when I did this was about 52 billion. It's one of those cases where every single one is offering the same direction, but it seems like the sum of the parts is greater than the company DCF. It's not huge enough that I'm going to go out and do something crazy. But I've actually valued companies. You value a company, you get 50. You value its parts, you get 85. Those are, that basically is a flag, that something is going on in the company that's dissipating or destroying value. Those are the companies, if you were an activist, that you would target to break up and value in pieces. So why don't we do this for every company? I mean, this seems like the right thing to do, right? If you're a multi-business company, why do we consolidate everything and try to put one growth rate and one cost of capital? Why not just break it up into parts and value? What, what are the impediments to doing this? Besides laziness. Information. What? Information. That is really the... So when people say, why aren't you valuing the company in parts? That's my answer. The information is not there. In fact, as I was valuing Valiant, one of the things I considered but abandoned was you can actually value it as Bausch & Lomb. So you can break it down, the drug business, because it's like four different businesses. And the information is okay until you get to revenues and EBITDA, and after that it becomes completely diffuse. So if you have a multi-business company, explore whether you can do it, because it's an interesting other way in which you can approach valuation. And once you get out there and you start doing some of the parts valuation, do it right. Just don't do a sum of the parts pricing, applying median multiples. That really is really a back of the envelope number. It's not a number you should be acting on. Any questions on sum of the parts valuation? Yes, Mark. Now, that, remember, when you value any company, it's not the company diversifying the risk away. Who's diversifying the risk away? The investors already have done it. So the fact that you can diversify the risk away gains you nothing. That's why diversification for a public company is a horrible reason for going out and doing acquisitions, right? Because I can do the diversification by calling my broker and not paying a 30% premium. Why the hell 
are you jumping in paying a 30% premium to diversify for me? So there is nothing gained in a public company level by diversifying because investors have already diversified away that risk. I'll tell you one other thing that does make this a little messy is it assumes the businesses are truly independent and separated. We talked about this, right? If you try to do this for Disney, ESPN you might be able to do. But theme parks and movies is fuzzier, right? Because if your movies do well, those characters show up in your theme parks. The more fuzzy the lines become between the businesses, the more difficult it becomes to value individual businesses. So that's some of the parts valuation or asset-based valuation. You can do it in accounting. You can do it in liquidation. You can do it as an activist investor. So now let's talk about private company valuation. The basic rules don't change. When you sit down to value a private company, you still have to make the decision you had to make when you, made a, when you looked at a public company. Am I valuing the business or am I valuing the equity of the business? If it's equity, you want cash flows to equity and discount of the cost of equity. If it's the business, you take cash flows to the firm, pre-debt cash flows and discount of the cost of capital. That script was written for public companies. It applies for private companies. There are two problems that you're going to face with private companies. The first is there is no market price for the company, right? By definition, it's a private company. And you're going to see how much we depend. We don't even realize how much we use the market price as a crutch in public companies. And we're going to talk about what happens when I take that crutch away. The second is if you think accounting standards for public companies are all over the place, you should see small private businesses. So the challenge you often face is actually reconstructing financials for a private business, not even using GAAP, just using common sense. So let's start with the first issue. No market value, who cares? There are three places you're going to notice the difference. The first is when you sit down to compute cost of capital, what do you need is weights for debt and equity. You need market value weights. And without market value weights, you're going to be kind of stuck. And if you use regression betas to come up with cost of equity, you're dead in the water. Because you try to go into Bloomberg and looking up the regression for your local grocery store, your you know, five and dime store, some private business, it's not going to be there. So we need market prices often to get to discount rates. And after you're done with the valuation, what's the first number you check to see if you're even within the ballpark? You check the market price, right? Much as we bitch and moan about markets, when your value is very, very different from the price. Now, I remember somebody was writing a British company. And the British have this very strange habit of stating the prices per share in pence. I think it's 1600s. You can buy something in pence. So it's say 378. And of course, who? I mean, the, no, we don't state the prices in cents. So, you, you know, so I, I remember somebody in this class valuing a British company coming up with five pounds per share and comparing the 378 and freaking out a little bit. <laughs> so, I must have screwed up. This was, luckily for me, one of the easier emails to answer. Just move the decimal po point two points over for, on the price or move it two points to the right on your value. You're going to be OK. But we do check against the price whether we like it or not. Right? And finally, if you, as I said, the risk measures we use, not just for the beta for the stock, but also ratings. You're not going to find them for. So you're, not having a market price does put you at a disadvantage. Let's talk about the cash flow issues. The first is most private businesses, most private businesses, don't have 50 years of history, 100 years of history, 150. They're often been around three, four, five years. Once in a while, you do get a private company that's been around a long time. And every, um, whenever you have that auction, you know, you know, the MBA auction where you raise money, the only thing I can offer of any value is I'll value a company for somebody who wants a company value. Nine times out of 10 people win the auction. They never come and even talk to me about valuing the company. So I've never, I've offered. But once in a while, you do get somebody who bids. You know, and I think about four or five years ago, somebody bids and wins the auction, says, I want, I'd like you to value my private business. And I'm thinking, how big can this be? You know, it's just one small business. He comes in with these stacks of documents. I said, what the hell is this? He says, this is my private business financials. And I said, what business are you in? So we make rum. 
already my mind is going, okay, this is not good. He said, he said, do you happen to be Miami-based? Yeah, he said, yes, yes, I'm part of the family that owns a company. You know what company you wanted me to value, right? He says, Bacardi. Company's been private for 300 years. Yeah. Lots of financials, lots of family members. Hey, he, you know, he, that, that semester I earned whatever you paid for the, uh, for the auction. <laughs> it made up for the nine other semesters where I didn't have to do a job. So the first is, for most private businesses, you're not going to get lots of history. Second is, as I said, accounting standards vary widely across private businesses. I remember about um, six or seven years ago, somebody in this class decides to value her mother's flower shop. He said, fine. About four or five weeks into the semester, she comes and says, I've got to change. I said, what happened? I said, oh, she went back to her mother and asked for financials. And her mother read, led her into a room filled where all the walls were covered with post-it notes, different colored post-it notes. There was a revenue wall, and there was the expense wall, and the extraordinary expense wall, and the uh, supply credit that she'd got wall. And, and basically, at the end of every year, she pulls off all the post-it notes from me. It, it's a system that worked for her, adds it all up, and creates an income statement. Not exactly GAAP or IFRS. I don't think there's a post-it component to it. Hey, but it's your small business, and you have all these other things to do. You're the salesperson, you're the inventory keeper, you're the accountant, you're the marketing person. Who has time to sit there six hours doing accounting things? So different accounting standards. The third is, in private business, and th this is not unique to just private businesses, you have two problems. The first is there are all these people who seem to be on the payroll, and you're not quite sure what they do. I call this the George Costanza. Remember in all those years of Seinfeld? I never quite figured out what George did. He was the assistant to the equipment manager to the Yankees. But I never saw, I think there was one episode where he replaced all of the uniforms with polyester or something, and the players all started to sweat to death. That's the only episode he did. But they said, what the hell does he do? And you get that same sensation with private business. You know, what does he do? What does he do? What does she do? They all seem to have the same last names as the owner, and they're wandering around doing nothing. And also, magically, every afternoon at 4 o'clock, the company car seems to go away somewhere, towards a school somewhere to pick up kids and take them back to home. There's a much more, or if you have a home office, come on. All kinds of stuff happens in that home office. Like there's a little kid's toy bin on the side, and you know, maybe even a kitchenette. You know. It's a little more intermingling with the person. And finally, this is a critical issue. Most private businesses, the owner doesn't charge himself or herself a salary. Why should they, right? Because they get to keep whatever's left over. You're saying, who cares? You try to buy a private business, and you base what you pay on the income you see. Do you see why you're going to overpay for the business? It looks like the restaurant makes 150000 You're saying, this is good. Then you buy the restaurant, what do you discover? That the person who ran the restaurant, who owned the restaurant, was doing all, starting with cooking, to serving, to maintain. And you buy the restaurant thinking you have $150,000 of profits. You can't cook, so you already have a problem. You've got to hire a cook now. You've got to hire an accountant, and hire an inventory keeper. Your $150,000 in profits could very quickly become minus $100,000 in losses. So very simple issues, again, common sense issues, but you could clean up for it. So here's the first step in valuing a private business. I remember about um, 15 years ago, I was you know, sitting in my office, and this lady comes you know, barging into my office. She says, I, you know, I, I'd like your help. I heard you do valuations. And I said, I don't know where you heard this. I n I've never done one. You know, I was kind of nervous. She said, I own a candy company, and I really, really need your help. I said, okay, I like candy, you know, this would be good. And so she says, can you help me? And I said, yes, but I have a few questions to ask, me, to ask you. I said, why, why exactly do you want to get this valuation done? She said, why else, you know? I said, let me list out possible reasons. Maybe you're just curious. You've run this business, you want to find out how much it's worth. Maybe because you have some taxes due. Yeah. 
Maybe you're in divorce court, and I don't know about it, and half this business is going to go to your spouse. Or maybe it's for a transaction. Oh, I say, okay. It's for a transaction. I said, so you plan to sell the business? She said, yes. So said, who do you plan to sell the business to? She said, you have a lot of questions. I said, I need to know. I can't put a number. And she said, what do you mean? Who, do you, who's, who are the buyers? She says, well, and, and I list out the possibilities. It could be a private buyer who's going to buy this candy. So it could be Mars, you know, company trying to buy it from you. It could be maybe you're big enough to go public and you just want to get a value to do it. She said, no, it's too small. We're actually going to be bought by another private individual. Without knowing the motives and the potential buyers, you can't value private business. That's very different from a public company, right? With a public company, you never ask, who are you selling it to? What's the motive? With private companies, you need to know the motive. And those motives can be all over the place. I told you that most private company valuations, or most valuations are private company valuations. Most private company valuations are not for transactions. They're for tax court. They're for divorce court. They're for accounting purposes. And you need to know what the motive is before you sit down and start to put numbers. And you're going to see this play out in the choices I make along the way. So this is for private businesses for sale. Sometimes you can confront the same issues when a public company decides to value a division. Like Ford in 2009, once you get rid of Jaguar Land Rover, they need a valuation of Jaguar Land Rover because you want to sell it to somebody. Maybe you want to spin it off to be a standalone entity. Maybe that's what Valiant should do, spin off Bausch & Lomb because it's the most valuable piece of, you know, and to make it. A, or maybe you want to do a sum of the parts valuation like we just did. So private company valuation is going to come in handy even if you work with public companies because there are times when you need those skill sets. So let's start about, let's, let's classify four types of transactions that we're going to value. And as you go through, you're going to see the difference. So you're valuing a private business, but I'm going to use very different techniques with each of the different scenarios. First, I'm going to look at a private to private transaction. You're a doctor, you're trying to sell your practice to another doctor, private to private. Right? Second, I'm going to talk about private to public. You're a private company being approached by a public company. How should you attach a value to the private company? Third. I'm going to talk about private companies that plan to go public. What is it that you would do differently about that? And finally, a private company that plans to approach venture capitalists, because you might not be ready to go public, how is your valuation going to be? Private to private, private to public, private to IPO, private to VC. Four scenarios, and you're going to see me play out different techniques in each one because I face different challenges. So let's start with the first one. The most difficult private company valuations are private to private transactions. That's because neither the buyer nor the seller is usually diversified. Usually. Sometimes it might not be true, but usually they're both putting the bulk of their wealth into that investment. Second, illiquidity is front and center because now that you put your entire wealth into this business, you worry more about what if something goes wrong. And third, with private to private transactions, especially if there's a human component, there's a key person issue. Let me explain. I have a medical, pr in fact, I, let me make this specific. My dentist in the town that I live in is planning to sell his practice. He's a very lucrative practice. He's looking at potential buyers, which are usually other dentists, or hopefully, right? no, because I don't want to go into some person and say, I'm learning dentistry right on you. But if I look at the financials, I'm the dentist looking at this business, and I look at the financials, and I buy this business. See the risk I face? This is a personal business, right? So you buy the business. I walk in two months from now. I come and say, who the hell are you? So I'm the new dentist. I say, no, 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 no new dentist in my mouth. I'm getting out of here. I have to do some references. You could buy a business that looks great, but when the person leaves, half the revenues could go away. So in private companies, sometimes there's a key person discount, which is when a, a big chunk of the value comes from the individual in the business, you have to factor in what will happen if that person leaves. So let's start with a very simple example. Let's assume that you go into an investment bank in June, which is what many of you are planning to go consulting firm, and you get sick and tired of it very quickly. So you drop out of the rat race. You always wanted to own a restaurant. 
You decide to take your entire wealth and buy a restaurant. You're buying this restaurant from, it's an it's a upscale restaurant. It's owned by the chef. It's done, I'll show you the financials for the last three years. It's done pretty well. And, but your entire wealth is going to be tied up in the business. In the most recent year, the restaurant reported a fairly healthy profit, 1.2 million in revenues and 400 million pre-tax operating profit. It has no debt outstanding, conventional debt, but it does have a lease on the restaurant that's going to run for the next 12 years and be 120,000 a year. You ready? Let's look at the financials. This part, we're going to do what we did with public companies with a little bit of a twist. So I start with the revenues. I do what I, you know, because a traditional, they're taking the lease expenses and operating expense. Remember with the re companies we capitalize, I'm going to do the same thing here. Why change the rules just because you're a private business? But here are the changes. Okay? If you look at the most recent year, so basically these are the actual financials. In the most recent year, you can see the 1.2 billion, um, billion in revenues. And you see a net income of 240,000 and operating income of 400,000. So let's clean up these financials. Because even though they, the, the numbers might not lie, we want to get a sense of what exactly does this mean if I buy the restaurant. So here are my clear, so we'll come back and clean up these numbers, but let's start by first looking at the discount rates. I have a private business, right? I'm buying the restaurant, saying, how do I come up with the cost of equity, cost of capital? And as I said, if you just use a beta and plug it in just like you do with public companies, you are making a serious mistake because remember, that beta measures only the risk you cannot diversify away. And we just said you're going to put your entire wealth into the restaurant. So as a private business, because you are investing entirely into this, I have to adjust my risk to reflect the fact that you're now going to be exposed to the rest of the risk. So I'll take you through the logic I went through about 20 years ago when I was thinking through this process because... This was a question I threw out to a bunch of private company appraisers in probably 91 and 92, the first time I'd ever done a keynote at private company appraisers. I said, what the hell do you guys do about the fact that beta measures only the market risk when you come up with the cost of equity? That cost of equity is not going to reflect it, and their response was, we just add a premium to it. A com they call it a company-specific premium, and that premium can be 8, 10, 12 percent. Basically, they said, we just make up the number. And they said, that doesn't work for me. I understand why you want a premium, but I need something more than I just made up this number. So uh, it's, here's where I started. I said, let me first go and get the only information I have, which is on public companies. And I looked up the unlevered beta across 75 publicly traded restaurants, and I came up with 0.86. I almost used that when I realized I had this upscale restaurant that had bore almost no resemblance to any of these companies in the list. So I switched and I went with high-end retailers as well. You're saying, are you allowed to do that? What we said earlier in this class, you're allowed to do whatever you want as, a, as long as you're comfortable doing it and you can justify it. To me, whether you go to a five-star restaurant is more closely driven by whether you walk into a high-end retailer than whether you walk into McDonald's. So the unlevered beta that I'm going to use to value this restaurant is 1.18. So if I were a diversified investor, that's the beta I would have. Now here's the logic I'm going to use to adjust that beta. Here's what I'd like you to think about. When you invest in a business, there are lots of different risks. So let's say there are 100 units of risk coming from all over the place. Let's say 20 units of that risk are market risk coming from macroeconomic factors, and 80 units come from every conceivable other kind of risk, that management could do stupid things or great things, that projects could go well or badly all those firm-specific components. I'm going to take you through an algebra problem. When I use beta, I'm capturing only the market risk, right? That 20 units of market risk. So if I'm a diversified investor, even though there are 100 units of risk, I see only 20 units, I price only 20 units. Not because I'm being blind and stupid, but because the other 80 will get diversified away in my portfolio. But you're a private buyer who's putting all your money into this one company. How many units of risk do you see? You see all 100 units. You, have no lux you don't have the luxury of saying, I'm going to count only the 20. So if I said my beta is 1.18 for the 20% of the risk that's market risk, what kind of beta are you seeing in the same company? You're going to see a beta five times higher, right? That's all it is. It's an algebra problem where I'm scaling up the beta to reflect the rest of the risk, the total standard deviation, rather than the portion of the standard deviation that's market risk. 
I called it total beta when I, when I concocted this measure. Notice I didn't use words like derived. There was no deep thought that went into this. I just uh, you know, scram, you know, scratched it on the back of an envelope and said, this looks OK. I called it total beta to reflect the fact that it captured total risk. That's the process I'm going to use. But to do this, what do I need? In addition to the beta for a sector, I need to know what percentage of the risk in a sector is market risk, right? Go back and if you remember the Bloomberg beta page that I showed, the beta was right there, right? Raw beta. Was there a statistic on that output page that told me something about where the risk was coming from? The R squared, remember the R squared? The R squared told me the proportion of the variance in the stock that came from the market. So here's what I did. I went and looked up the average R squared across high-end retailers. The R squared is 25%. Now, there's a little inside statistics tangent I've got to take you off on. Beta is a standard deviation measure. What do I mean by that? Statistically, if you look at the definition of a beta in a, in a, in a, in a regression, the beta is not the R squared, it's a rho JM, correlation between the stock and the market times the standard deviation of the stock divided by the, we never use that equation because it falls out of the regression. Beta is a standard deviation measure. R squared looks at the proportion of your variance that comes from the market. But because this is a standard deviation, I have to take the square root of the R squared, which of course gives me, come on, it's R squared. If I take the square root of R squared, I'm going to end up with R, which is the correlation coefficient. The square root of 0.25 is 0.5. So dividing 1.18 by 0.5 gives me a total unlevered beta for this business of 2.36. You will see twice as much risk in this business than a public, than a diversified investor would have simply because you put your entire wealth in there. You know how this is going to show up? When you have good or bad years as a restaurant. I mean, for instance, you could have a gas main blow up in front of your restaurant, which often happens in New York City. Nobody can come to your restaurant for two months. You can't say, this, I'll diversify this away. Your entire wealth is in that damn restaurant. That's what you're trying to capture with the higher cost of equities. No longer have the luxury of being blasé about things, saying it'll all get averaged out, because there's nothing to average it out with. So that unlevered beta is what I use to come up with my cost of equity. And for my debt to equity ratio, I actually use the debt to equity ratio of restaurants. That might seem like I'm mixing and matching, but my only debt is a lease on the real estate. So I ended up using the same kind of debt to equity ratio I would have as a regular restaurant, 14.33%. That's basically the debt to equity ratio that gives me a levered beta of 2.56, which translates into a cost of equity of 14.5%. So actually done in the pre-2008, risk-free rate was 4.25%, the risk premium was 4%. But if you're doing it today, your risk-free rate would be 2.25%, your risk premium would be in six. We're using all of the technology and the structure of a public company. The only thing we're replacing is the market beta gets replaced with the total beta. Michelle, you look a little yeah. skeptical. It, in this case, they're both, both restaurants and retailers tend to have, that's, that's 90% of their debt is lease debt, because the alternative is to use a book debt to equity, right? And the problem with book debt to equity of the private business is you have to trust the book equity, which as I pointed out, without the owners charging themselves income is kind of a strange number. So I really have no choice but to go to a market debt to equity. You know what the other one is? I could call the owner and ask, do you have a target debt to equity ratio? You can try this. I never get an answer. The answer I usually get is, what's the target debt to equity? So hang up the phone, use a market debt. Because in a sense, I need a debt to equity. And in this case, I'm assuming that in this business, you have to lease to survive. And that's where the debt to equity is. It doesn't make a huge difference. Obviously, 14%, I could have ended up with 5 or 10 or 15% wouldn't have made that much of a difference in my calculation. To get the cost of debt and capital, yes? Yeah, you can use the book value of debt. In fact, in general, for most companies, the book debt and the market debt is not going to be that different, right? When does the book debt become very different from the market debt? If you have a distressed company, is when book debt and market debt are going to seriously deviate. So that's why on the, on the project, some of you ran into this, how do I get market value of debt? 
step back. These are 300 publicly traded companies. They're money-making companies. That none of them is, is going to be in serious distress. Otherwise, I w they wouldn't have made that list. So using book debt as market debt is not going to be the end of the world. Okay? So you can always use book debt, but the market equity is really what you're missing. Okay? To get the cost of debt, I went down the other pathway I created for public companies, which is if you don't have a rating, you can use an interest coverage ratio. I can get an interest coverage ratio for a private business just as well as I can for a public company. The interest coverage ratio I got was 3.33, based on lease expenses being debt payments. The rating that I came up with based on the coverage ratio is double B plus, and the cost of debt that I ended up with was about 7.5%, based on the spread. At, uh, the spread was 3.25%, 3 added to the risk-free rate, 7.5%. Net of taxes, I have an after-tax cost of debt of 4.5%. So because of the way I approach estimating betas and cost of debt for public companies, this was not a particularly you know, big break for me because I'm doing exactly the same things I do with the public company applied to private businesses. Overall, my cost of capital for the company is 13.25%. So I have my cost of capital for a private business. Again, the big difference is replacing the market beta with the total beta. And be clear, it's not because it's a private business I'm doing it. It's because you as the buyer are not diversified. I cleaned up the financials. Yeah. For the uh, debt to equity, the funds that it's claiming capital as a buyer, should I not use uh, my debt to equity or the debt to equity that I could get? It is always your debt to equity, but it's always your market debt to equity. See, the problem I'm facing is not that I don't know what your debt is. I don't have your market equity, right? And because I don't have your market equity, I'm doing the song and dance and going with the industry average. There is another way to do this if you don't like to use industry averages. What would that be? Instead of using, you can't use book equity. I said that's off the table. If you don't like to use industry averages, is there a way you can use a stand-in for market equity? You could always use pricing, right? You could take the net income and apply a PE ratio and come up with it. Or you can get really fancy and check the iteration box in Excel and use your own estimated value of equity as the market value of equity. Does it make your head spin? Basically, it means that you're going to create a circular reasoning in your spreadsheet, right? Because to get my cost of capital, I will need a debt to equity. And to get my debt to equity, I'll need my value. So basically, I, I, but by checking the iteration box, it'll spin around. And you will actually get a debt to equity ratio that is consistent with your own estimate of the value of the equity. But before you do that, make sure the iteration box is checked off. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to blow up on you. Now, to clean up my operating income, first thing I did was I moved leases from operating to financials for exactly the same reasons I do them with public companies. But the big change was I had to hire a chef. Why? I was an investment banker until last year. I, you know, I'd take out for, what, four years in a row. I'd never been in my kitchen. Can't exactly run a restaurant right now. So I hire a chef. I pay him a lot, or her a lot, because this is a high-end restaurant. So 350,000, I'm sorry, 150,000, which pushes up my wages from 200,000 to 350,000. So I move leases, I pay more in wages. I come up with an operating income of 370,000 that reflects those changes put in. So leases leave, wages come in. I have a $370,000 operating income. I'm getting closer. I have a cost of capital. I have an operating income now that I think is closer to what I will use in my valuation. Third step, I'm going to stop and ask, should I be attaching a discount? Because the chef who's been running this restaurant, perhaps as a clientele, that really likes him or her. So if that's the case, then I have to factor how much of my operating income I will lose if he leaves. How the hell are you going to come up with this number? You could stand outside the restaurant as customers leave and say, if I became the chef, would you still come back to the restaurant? Or you put up a name. You know, that's going to be a little awkward, right? But this is part of the negotiation. When you sit down to negotiate to buy this restaurant, you're not going to offer based on 270000 You're going to have this caveat. If you leave, how do I know how much the operator? And remember, you as a seller 
have an equally strong incentive to leave the number at 270,000. So what can you do to reassure me that bad things are not going to happen when you leave? You know what dentists do when a new dentist buys the practice? What does the old dentist often tend to do? He hangs out for a couple of years, not because he doesn't want to move to Florida, but because that allows for a period where he's still around. So that's why an often for private businesses where there's a key person involved, you'd see an overlap where the old owner stays on for a period while the new owner comes on to allow for that transition. But if you feel there's going to be some lost income, then you have to adjust that lost income by knocking it off your operating income. So as an example, we took the 370000 I had as operating income and said 20% of that will leave. If this chef leaves, the operating income I would use in my valuation is 296000 so let's say in this case, the chef is going to leave. He doesn't want to stick around. You're going to reduce your operating income by that 20%. And you now have an operating income that you're going to build your valuation on. Last step in the process is I've got to put in a growth and a reinvestment. And everything we said about growth and reinvestment before applies, right? Even if I assume that the growth rate is going to be only 2%, I can't grow without reinvesting. In this case, reinvesting might be you know, replacing my, my oven in the kitchen or whatever I need to do, the air conditioning in the restaurant, the chairs, in the, so the furniture in the restaurant. So in this case, to estimate how much I'll have to reinvest, I'm going to assume a return on capital, a pretty high one, because in a sense, the, the comparative advantage comes from the fact that you already have the location and the chef. 20% return on capital, 2% growth rate gives me a reinvestment of about 10% a year. I'm going to set that aside each year to cover my needs to keep the restaurant going. That's pretty much it. I'm ready to do the valuation. My adjusted operating income now is 296000 Reviewing how I got there, I took the existing financials, I took out the lease expense, put in a salary, and then took 20% off for the key person leaving. The tax rate I used was the tax rate as an individual you will face. Because remember, you're not a corporate anymore. You're an individual. I used a 40% tax rate. The cost of capital is 13.25%, reflecting the fact that you're completely undiversified. And the reinvestment rate is 10%. With those numbers put in, the value that I get for the restaurant, as a restaurant, is $1.449 million. But remember, that's the value of the restaurant. But you also have this lease commitment for the next seven years, right? The present value of the lease commitment is 928000 Your equity value in the restaurant, because you're, you're paying for just the equity, because after all, the lease is being passed on to you. You're going to pay only 521000 for this restaurant. And that looks like an insane bargain, right? The operating income is 370000 but you can see very quickly with private businesses how you might end up paying only two or three times income, not the eight times income you see with public companies, because there are so many layers at which you've lost money. Any questions? So the mechanics are very similar to valuing a public company. You just have to use common sense to expand how you think about discount rates and cash flows. And if you can do that, then you can value private businesses just as well as you can value public companies. Yes? I just made up a number because it's 2% growth rate. If it were a 15% growth rate, that I could look at industry averages, I could look at what your competitive advantages are. At 2%, it wasn't even worth the trouble. So basically, I just had to. In fact, if you don't want to do that, you can just look at the replacement cost. Because remember, you're going to stay in the same restaurant. You're not, not assuming capacity increases. You, must, uh, you could just sit down and ask yourself, how often will I have to spruce up the restaurant? Set aside a sinking fund for that, because that's what you're doing. right? You're setting aside enough money each year to cover that cost when it comes. So it doesn't hit you. And that's the problem. A lot of private businesses, they don't set that aside because it's not explicit right now. And then there is that f your f f one or two things happen. One is they never put money back into their store or restaurant. And after about four or five years, it looks like crap and people stop coming. Or they get surprised. Oh my god, I never saw this coming. I now have to invest a million dollars into it. You just want to make sure you And that's all the reinvestment is. It's a sinking fund you're setting aside to cover the fact that there are always these big investments you have to make once in a while to keep the restaurant going. One other thing, I assumed a perpetuity. Do I have to? In fact, there's a 12-year lease, right? You're buying this restaurant. 
What do you worry about, especially when you buy a restaurant with a lease space? It's a great lease space. It's 12 years. You're saying, I can renew it. Renew it, true, but at a negotiated lease. The owner sees you're doing really well, and he can hike up the lease. So if you really are prudent, you might say, look, this is a great restaurant, nice space, but I'm going to act like it has only a 12-year life, not a perpetuity. Right? So basically, all you need to do is project out 12 years of cash flows growing at 2% a year and discount it back and be done. There's no salvage value, no liquidation value. Maybe you can sell the equipment from the kitchen for whatever you can get, but that's going to be tiny. But don't get caught up in perpetuities with private businesses. It might be much, much more sensible if you have a small private business, especially one built on a lease, to just do it through the end of the lease. Final step. Remember, you're going to put all your wealth into this restaurant, right? So you're investing 521000 And you worry about what will happen if things go bad. And as I said, I accept the fact that liquidity is a concern, that you've got to knock off something of the value. But I'm going to argue it should be different for different businesses, different across time, and different for different buyers. So let's think about ways in which we can cost out liquidity, how much the discount should be. The standard approach used by most appraisers is to draw on one of two studies. The first are studies of what are called restricted stock. Can you describe what restricted stock is? If you're a public company and you want to issue shares in the market, you usually have to go through an SEC approval process. You've got to file with the SEC. The SEC actually allows you this, this escape hatch where you can skip that process of registering with the SEC. But in return for doing that, your shares are restricted. Restricted in what sense? The people who buy those shares are not allowed to trade them for one year. It used to be two, but now one year after they get the shares. You see how this allows you to observe liquidity? Because these are publicly traded companies. Let's say the stock price is $10. You're somebody who's going to buy my restricted shares. And what do I tell you when you buy the shares? You can't trade for a year. You're clearly not going to pay, pay $10. But if I can see how much you pay, then I can see how much you value liquidity. So if you pay $9.50, you're attaching a 5% discount. If you pay $8.50, it's 15%. It's one of those few chances you actually get to observe how much people demand for liquidity. So those are called restricted stock studies. The only problem with restricted stock studies is only about 50 to 60 companies do it each year. And these are really strange companies. Because a healthy company is not going to leave 15, 20% of the table on restricted stock. So it's a small, strange sample. Statistically, you can already see the problem with doing this. The second set of studies look at IPOs, like the SNAP IPO. And then they go back in the months before the IPO, usually three to six months. And they look to see whether any of the owners of the business sold a share or their share in the business to somebody else and compare the price at which they sold it at to the IPO price. And they measure how much of a discount. Say that's because of liquidity. Those are the two big building blocks for discount. And based on those, people come up with these astronomically high liquidity discounts, 30%, 35%. The restricted stock studies, for instance, most of the studies find about a 35% discount to 40% discount, which means if the stock price is $10, the people buying these shares are paying six fifty seven. The IPO studies? are even crazy. They find 40 to 50% discounts. And this is great for appraisers for a very simple reason. Most appraisers work for taxpayers. And 90% of valuations in private companies, I said, is for tax purposes. You want the number to be as low as possible. So these studies allowed appraisers to go to the court and say, look, guys, the discount is 40%. Look, there's a study backing it up. These are courts. You show them a study. So oh, that's good. There's a study. Look, there's a number there, 40%. You can knock it off 40%. It's an incredibly lazy, sloppy way of doing this. But that's pretty much what these studies do. In fact, until um, I, you know, Bill, Bill Silber often laughs about this. He says, of all the papers he's ever written or books he's written, the one that is referenced the most was one he wrote in the summer over a couple of weeks on restricted stocks. And what he did was he said, OK, we have the study of restricted shares. We see the discounts. We compute a median. Why do we stop at the median? The discount seems to be smaller for some companies and bigger for others. Why are they different? Very sensible question. In fact, he ran a regression of the size of the discount 
against how much the company had in revenues, whether it was, you know, the, how, how big the block was that was being placed, whether the company was making money, and whether the person buying the shares had a customer relationship, in which case the numbers can get fuzzy because you can get paid in one way or the other. See, runs his regression. All the t-statistics were significant. But the key was he now said, look, this counts there even across restricted stock companies for obvious reasons. Companies with higher revenues seem to have smaller discounts. Companies that make money seem to have smaller discounts than companies that lose money. So essentially, it was a way in which he could differentiate across companies which were involved in restricted stocks. So it's one step beyond the, you no, know, just take the median and run with it for every company. In fact, I took uh, Bill's study and I kind of converted it into a way in which you can, so let's say that you work, go to work for a private company appraisal firm, and they say, look, our base is 25%. We knock off 25% of the value of private company. And you get a $300 million company come in and a $3 million company come in. So two very different revenues. You know? So the revenues are 300. If you believe the silver study, the company with $300 million in revenue should have a much smaller discount than the 3 million. So what I did was I took the silver regression and I quantified how much the discount would vary based on revenues from 5 million to a billion and how much would vary depending on whether you're a money making or a money losing company. So the way to read this, is if you have a $10 million money losing company, your discount should be 33%. And that's based on the. But if you have a billion dollar company that's making money, your discount should be only 16%. So I'm just using that regression and milking it for everything I can to allow me to get variation in discounts across companies. Okay. I'm sure Bill won't approve of this, but uh, no, you got to come up with a discount and you give me a regression, I'm going to milk that regression in terms of saying uh, this is how much revenues matter. So the fundamental problem with both these restricted stock and IPO studies is a statistical problem. In statistics, one thing you always have to worry about in a sample is there a, sele is there a selection bias. And I just told you with restricted stocks that the companies that use restricted stock are troubled, strange companies. You know why that matters? When you see that discount, the bulk of that discount might have nothing to do with liquidity and more to do with the fact that you're a company that's so troubled now that you have to raise money at a 35% discount. Think about this IPO discount that claims is a 40% discount. Do you think any SNAP owner is going to be willing to sell his or her shares at a 40% discount on the 25 billion that you see floating out there as a price? If you can, let me know, because I'd like to buy the shares from this person. In fact, if you have an IPO that feels like it's on the pathway to success, where you think there's, you're not going to accept a 40% discount. You might not even accept a discount, because you want the jump in the offering price. So you think, but they found it in these studies. What are they doing in these studies? They're looking at all companies that have managed to go public and look at transactions in those companies Prior to, do all companies that plan to go public actually go public? About 40% of companies that plan to go public pull their public offerings. For whatever reason. You see where I'm going next? If you want a real IPO study, you got to look at transactions both of successful IPOs and unsuccessful ones, because what you might be capturing is a combination of illiquidity and the uncertainty you feel about whether the IPO will happen so if you're three months ahead of a small IPO and you have no idea whether it's going to happen, you're going to build into your pricing both factors. But unfortunately, these are the studies that private company appraisals have been built on. And on December 6th, they're going to pay a price for doing so. The IRS, and you might have read about this, is, I don't know, it's a number two. The IRS, like accounting, has all these rule numbers that go into the hundreds. It's like rule 206 that they're going to come up with. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to ban the use of liquidity discounts in estate tax valuations. Think of how much difference it's going to make. You'll be knocking. Remember, the estate taxes, if, right now the estate taxes, you pay 40% of whatever the value of your estate is if it's over $10 million, right? So if you have a $25 million estate, here's what I'm doing now. I'm valuing it at $25 million knocking off 30% and claiming the estate is worth only 17 and a half million and paying taxes on the 17 and a half minus 10. 
40% of 7.5 million is 3 million. If this rule passes, the 25 million has to stay where it is. I'll now have to pay double the tax I did before. So in fact, there are a wave of people actually trying to get their value. I, I guess you have to die before December 6th. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of a cost you have to pay. <laughs> die soon, die soon, so we can do this before December 6th. Okay. So th but there's this huge rush of trying to get stuff done before the rule changes. But on November 8th, all of a sudden, the stress seemed to be removed. Why? One of, one of Trump's tax proposals is to remove the estate tax entirely. So this whole thing could become academic. But you can see very quickly why appraisers were set themselves up. Because by being lazy and sloppy, they've allowed the IRS the high ground, which is, you guys use those IPO studies over and over again. They're crappy studies. So what's your basis for liquidity discount? So I'm getting more calls now from private company appraisers. That, when are you going to do a study on liquidity? I said, I don't want to do a study on liquidity. Okay. Because they now want to do what they should have done 30 years ago, of thinking serious. But let's face it, liquidity matters. We all know that. The IRS is wrong to claim that there's no liquidity discount. Let's accept that. But to push back, you need something more than restricted stock and IPO studies. So that's where I've been pushing towards. I've been doing it for a long time. So I'm actually going to do, you know, do something on liquidity. But I'm going to draw on a much larger sample. What I said at the start of this discussion, that every investment has a liquidity discount. But with publicly traded stocks, we call that a bid-ask spread. Right? There are 41,889 publicly traded stocks, and each of them has a spread. That's a big sample. So you can't accuse me of sampling bias. What if I looked at differences in spreads across companies? Why, do, why does a small NASDAQ company have a 10% spread and IBM have none? I mean, the, the first reason is there's more trading volume. So I'm going to look at trading volume. But maybe big companies have smaller spreads than small companies. Companies in risky sectors, like technology, have bigger spreads than companies in safe sectors. You see where I'm going to go? I'm going to take the sample of 41,089 companies and look at variables that explain the difference in the spread. Ten years ago, I actually did this with just the New York Stock Exchange stocks. And I ran a regression of the spread as a percentage of the price. It's a percentage spread. And I ran a regression against the revenues of the company, whether the company made money. I, I just basically stole from the silver regression and said, let me throw everything I can into the regression. I looked at how much cash they had, the reasoning being if you have a lot of cash, I care less about liquidity because your cash is already liquid, and how much the trading volume was. Came up with a regression. You're saying, how is that going to help me come up with an illiquidity discount for a private business? What if I plugged in the numbers for my private business? In this case, a restaurant, I plugged in the revenues, 1.2 million, the fact that it was making money, that 5% of its value came from cash, and it had no trading volume. I treated a private business as a public company that never trades. I came up with 12.88%. You say, what does that mean? If this private company is being priced the same way public companies are, I'd expect the liquidity discount, or the bid-ask spread, to be 12.88%. That then becomes my estimate of the liquidity discount. It's a very, this, this was a very rough regression. I didn't do all the bells and whistles that I would do if this were truly carefully well. So I don't want to do that, but that's what I suggested that the appraisers need to do is find somebody who's incredibly bored, who wants to do this, and I'll take the entire database. Because there is gold here to be mined. There's an incredible amount of data, and it doesn't suffer from the sampling biases. And the discount you're going to get is going to be very different from these 25% or even the 25% adjusted for all those small things, revenues being higher. So to me, this is the pathway we need to follow to come up with a liquidity discount, is find a more creative, better sampled way of coming up with the number. So that's private to private. Remember to adjust the cost of equity and capital. The buyer is not diversified. Remember to adjust for the key person. Remember to adjust for liquidity. And by the time you're done, don't be surprised to see a value that is so much smaller than what you'd expect if the company were public. Now let's switch gears. I show you this number. As the potential seller of the restaurant, and you're massively disappointed. It's like 450,000. You were expecting like millions. 
He said, can I do better than this? So let me turn that on you. I'm the, I'm the potential seller of the restaurant. I'm very disappointed with this number that's been given to me, 450 to 500,000. What could I do to pump up my value? I could cook the box, but that would be illegal. Or I could find a better buyer, right? In fact, if I could get Arc Restaurants, which is a na nationwide restaurant chain that is publicly traded, to buy my restaurant, here are the things that are going to happen. When I do my cost of capital now, remember, Arc Restaurant is owned by investors who are diversified. There's no rationale for adjusting the beta. And once this restaurant becomes part of a publicly traded company, if I want liquidity, what do I do? I just sell my shares. I don't have to shell, sell the entire restaurant. The liquidity discount goes away. And the private company beta adjustment goes away. And in fact, if I do that, here's what happens. My cost of capital, instead of being 13.25%, becomes 8.76%. So I use a conventional beta. And my valuation, instead of being 453000 which is what I had as a private-to-private -private transaction, becomes a million and a half. The liquidity discount goes away. And the market beta replaces the total beta. But let's play hardball here. You're Arc Restaurants. I'm the, restaurant, uh, I'm the private owner. Are you going to start off offering me 1.48 million? So you be Arc Restaurants. I'll be the private owner. So what are you going to start your bidding at? I'm going to start at 453,000. So I'm like, this is your, you're going to use all the private company lingo. You know, you're a private business. You're very illiquid. The fact you never mentioned the fact that I'm, and if you're a private business and you're savvy, you're going to push back saying, no, no, I'm now going to become part of you. There should be. And where you end up will depend on what? It depends on partly negotiation skills and partly on bargaining power, right? If there's only one publicly traded restaurant in the entire country chain, then you're going to end up closer at 454000 than the $1.45 million. If I can get two publicly traded restaurants fighting for me, then my odds improve, right? Because I can start playing you off against each other. So where you end up will depend on the relative supply and demand. There are lots of private restaurants and very few publicly traded restaurant companies willing to buy them. You're going to end up closer at 454000 Remember when we talked about acquisitions, we talked about the one. We haven't talked about acquisitions. Never mind. When we talk about acquisitions. There's one special area of acquisitions. The one place where people have been able to make money is when public companies buy private businesses and grow by rolling up private businesses, because this is how you can do it. Is you can pay less than the 1.45 million, so you're getting surplus, and you're paying more than the 453,000, which means the set. So both sides walk away, saying, I want this game. And that's the way, you know, if you really want an acquisition that creates value, that's the kind of acquisition you're looking for. So 454, 1.484, you can see that your negotiate. I mean, but when you walk in, you shouldn't be stupid, right? You can't give away the game. So as, the, as a private buyer, you walk in and say, well, it's 450,000, I'll ask for a 10% premium. You know what? They're going to act like they're, they're being dragged to the altar, but the reality is, if they get it for 500000 they're getting an incredible bargain. So my suggestion for private business owners is value your company as a private to private, put into one pocket. Value it as a private to public, put in the other pocket. Remember which pocket you put which number in. <laughs> Look at both numbers before you walk in. And then negotiate. Any questions? Let's talk about private to IPO. Yes, go ahead. doesn't matter. All of the issues would still arise, right? So why would selling 51%? First, there's a control issue that you're going to run into. That 5149, you know, we'll come back and talk about in the context of acquisitions. But let's assume you want to sell 51 instead of 100%. How is it going to be any different whether you're selling? Because if you're selling it to a private person, they're still going to have all the same issues with 100%. If you're selling to a public company, they're still going to control the company with 51%, so they can do what they want. It's now, so when they do their accounting, they would reflect the 51% that belongs to them. That part now has become liquid, right? Because it's become part of a company. So everything we said for 100% would still apply to 
then you have a control issue and then I'd have to do two valuations, which is if your restaurant is badly managed and badly run, you're going to continue to run it. So it's like Nick's offer, you 49%. My advice is pay very little because James Dolan is still running the team. The guy can't run you know, $20 in a brown paper bag if you ask him to run it. And as long as he runs the team, you're not going to pay full price. The, the Knicks should be one of the most valuable basketball franchises on the face of the earth. You know what the scary thing is? In spite of all of the crappy stuff they've done for the last 20 years, they're still the second most valuable franchise in the NBA. You know the most valuable one is? It's the Lakers. Don't let your fandom get in the way of your day. Right? <laughs> Much as I'd like to tell you that the Bulls are the most valuable, or the you know, Cleveland Cavs are the most, they're not. I mean, it's the Los Angeles Lakers because it's media. And, and that's the thing about professional sports. It's not how successful you are. You got the media market. You got the value. And if you have a national franchise, which is what the Lakers and the Knicks have because our fans all over the place, that gets, you know. so they're private to private. So if you get a chance, in fact, look at the Forbes listing of franchise values, because they do it every year, right? They do the NFL, they do the MLB. They actually even do sports, the big sports team, Manchester United, Real Madrid. It's, um, I'm not sure what, they're first doing pricing, not valuation. You know what I mean by pricing? They basically put a multiple of the media market built in or the revenue. So. It's, but it's interesting to think about what that number would look like and whether it's a pricing to a diversified or an undiversified investor. Because those are all issues coming to the surface with sports franchises. So when we, get to, when we still come back on Monday, we will talk about IPOs. And we will start on packet three on Monday. So if you get a chance, pick up packet three. Acquired company, right? What's the only yeah. difference between a public company and a private company? Yeah. I'm looking at it. I still use the unlevered beta for X cost. I still use the debt ratio for the target company. I still use the cost of asset. The only difference between the two buyers was one was diversified, the other wasn't. Yeah. So the diversified investor looked at the target company. They're both looking at the target company, and they see different risks in the target company yeah. because one is diversified yeah. and the other is not. But the cash flows are good. The cash flows are still the target company. The risk is still the target company. Because uh, they're both building off the same unlevered beta. Okay. But the case here is because you're not diversified, you're going to be willing to pay less. And if this were actually a bidding war, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, diversified guys win. 
but we're still following the same rules. It's just that in the case of private businesses or the private buyer, three different potential buyers, depending on one being completely undiversified, one being partial, can, uh, can look at the same company and come up with three numbers. Okay. And the three numbers are coming from what's in the rest of their portfolio. Affecting, you know, and so that's where the big the twist is. Sorry, and my second question is about the, when we deconstruct the multiples, yeah. I understand we do it to, to see which are the fundamental variables behind the multiple. Yeah. And if we do that and then we like do the regressions, we'll then be able to explain the, how the multiple works right. based on data of like a big size. Mm -hmm. right? However, if instead of doing the regression, we just deconstruct the multiple and use our company data to compare the cash, to compare how unpriced or overpriced. Are you value? Is. No, actually, valuing. You value. So you're not pricing. Yeah, yeah. You're you're value. So if you're going to value, you'll then do the valuation right. But it would be the same as why doing the DCF and kind of comparing. Why, right? why are you yeah, going to yeah. use a multiple then, right? Why don't you just go back to DCF? The problem with trying to use those equations that I have for the multiples, they're, they're very rigid DCF models. I force you to undergo the discount model or free cash flow yeah. model. I force you to use the same growth rate. So if we're going to go the intrinsic value route, we can do it with the DCF yeah. and get, keep complete flexibility. So when you go down the pricing route, you don't want to open that intrinsic value equation because then you're doing a half-assed DCF, yeah. not a full set. Yeah, yeah. So that's why the only reason we do those intrinsic equations is to see what variables we should be controlling. Okay. Right. And the so when we assess the how bullish we 